Thank you. I'm glad to be here, and I'd like to call out my co-convener, Andrea King Collier. Thank you, and a thanks to all of the people who contributed. Uh, when I was invited to be part of this, and I was told there would be a brief presentation involved, I thought, oh, 20 to 30 people. What's so big about that? How hard could that be? I am so glad that I was wrong. I am so glad to see so many people here who care about this issue. So the primary focus of our group was on access to healthy food, particularly for underserved and vulnerable populations. And what I want to do in the even briefer time that I just got told from our convener was, I want to talk about three things. First is, what is access to healthy food? A second is, I want to talk about what are some of the things that are going on around Michigan that hold promise for transforming access. And the third thing I want to talk about is, if we did more of these things on a big scale, what could that impact be? OK, so what is access? I want to tell you a little story. I was at a meeting a couple of months ago, and a woman got up who told us the story of her journey of trying to find out what kind of access she had to fresh fruits and vegetables in her neighborhood. And so the first thing she did is she walked down to the corner place where she could get some fresh fruit. It was a local gas station. And she bought an apple, and she showed us. It was a beautiful, red, delicious apple, and she paid a dollar for it. And then the next thing that she did, she and her 12-year-old daughter took a bus about two miles down to the closest kind of corner market, corner store that they had. And she bought a package, um, you've all seen them, a little styrofoam container with a couple pieces of fruit in it wrapped in plastic. She bought two apples and she paid $1.69. So now we're at about 85 cents an apple. Now she happens to have a car and so she and her daughter then drove to the closest grocery store that they could get to, which was about 10 miles away. And they bought a bag of apples for $1.99. And they, so now they're paying about 11 cents an apple. So is this access? Well, I think it all depends. If what you want, if all you want is to be able to buy just one or two maybe kinds of fruit, and you don't mind paying about five times more than what you paid in a major grocery store, then yes, you have access. But if you don't have a car or easy access to public transportation, and you want to be able to purchase a variety of fresh fruits and vegetables to feed your family, I think you might come down on the side of no, that really isn't access. Recently, the Michigan Department of Agriculture, in, in conjunction with the Census Bureau, used census tracts to see which areas in Michigan meet their definition of limited access to a grocery store. Now, they had some definitions. It had to be a population of low or moderate income residents, a below average density of grocery stores, and travel limitations to grocery stores. You know what they found? Every county in the state, every county had at least one area, often more, that qualified. What this means is that 59% of all Michigan residents live in an area that is underserved, according to this definition. That's a lot of people. We found that we can't talk about access unless we also talk about affordability. One person we talked with who works in a community center asked us this question. So who defines what's affordable? Is it having enough money in your pocket to buy fresh food? Or is it the ability to use food stamps? Or is access satisfied by being able to feed your family in tough times through the local food pantry or a soup kitchen? And then here's another question. Is it enough? to just have the food available. Community advocates and public health people around the state agreed that physical access is just a piece of the access puzzle. You know the adage, build it and they will come? It might be true in some communities, but if we build it, 
if people don't come, then how long will these communities be viable markets for farmers and other food producers? One contributor who runs a community-based farmers market told us, in our community, along with trying to increase the availability of higher quality foods, we spend a lot of time in education and outreach because, unfortunately, a high fat, high sodium dollar meal at the fast food restaurant across the street is cheaper and easier than trying to get the food, bring it home, prepare a meal for your family, and if you have kids, trying to get them to eat it. So, I really will use a couple of slides here. Okay. As we talked with people around the state, there was clearly no consensus on every single point, but there were some overarching themes that came up, and there were three. One is that we should view food as a solution, not as a problem. As one contributor told us, it's all about what lens we use to look at this issue. A second theme was that it should be sustainable and community driven. And the third theme we heard around access is that it should be used to increase the economic viability of the community and the state. And as you'll see, these core themes are woven throughout um, the strategies that I'll be sharing with you. So, what is our goal? Mike Ham earlier told us that we should think big, and so we did. Our goal is that by 2020, at least 95% of Michigan residents will have easy access to affordable, fresh, healthy food. Right now we have 41%. Our goal is at least 95%, and we believe we can do it. So now let me tell you about some of the things that are going around, on around Michigan that if we ramped up or expanded or fully financed and supported, we think could have a significant impact on access to healthy food. We clustered these, all of the ideas that we heard, into five big categories, and I'll walk us through each of those. There are many, many things under each one, and I'm just going to highlight one, maybe at most two, in each of those categories. Okay, so our first category is grocery stores. Remember, Rachel had to drive 10 or so miles to get to the closest grocery store. So, okay, I'm curious. All right, anybody here who can walk to a grocery store, raise your hand. Whoa, okay. Anybody um, who can't walk, do you live within two miles of a grocery store? Okay, what about five miles? Major grocery store. 10 miles? Anybody have to go over 10 miles to get to a grocery store? Okay, somebody? Okay. Well, the focus in this, I mean, I, this might be an unrepresentative group if we have 59% of people with limited access. But, so, our focus here in the grocery store arena is to really provide training and finance to <coughs> launch new grocery stores, or to increase the quality of existing grocery stores throughout Michigan. And why would we focus on this? Well, one is, it's, sort of, it's obvious, it would greatly improve healthy and affordable options for people. But interestingly enough, there's some data that's come out that says the addition of just one local supermarket in a community <coughs> contributes to a 32% increase in fruit and vegetable consumption by nearby residents. So if we want to increase not just access, but consumption, a grocery store is a way to do it. There are some innovative models going on in Detroit right now around this issue. Let me highlight one of them. The Detroit food, Fresh Food Access Initiative. Are many people here aware of it? Okay. This is a collaborative of several organizations. They're focusing on improving the quality of existing stores, or getting new stores to open. They have an interesting mix of strategies. They're providing technical <coughs> assistance. They're providing a clearinghouse. They're providing with assisting in um, securing financing. They're helping to link grocery stores with community partners, deal with issues around <coughs> city council regulations and things like that. They're in conversation with 22 stores at the moment. So can you imagine if we expanded this throughout the state? 
Okay, there we are. Our second category is community-based markets. Expanding the number of grocery stores that underserved communities is just one point on the access wheel. There are opportunities in every corner of Michigan to either create new community level strategies or create new versions of old community strategies that can greatly expand access to healthy food. And because they're community based, they also address a community's unique cultural and economic characteristics. You can see the list <coughs> under the green box on the slides, farmers markets, community gardens, etc. These strategies are relatively low cost in comparison with grocery stores and they can be implemented fairly quickly. But let's, let me talk about community gardens for a minute. Who has a garden here? Wow, okay. Who's part of a community garden? Wow, okay, this is a great group. I was intrigued to learn about some of the benefits of community gardens. I mean, there's of course the beauty, the experience of working with other people, the food that you get, etc. But a study of urban gardeners in Flint found that adults with a household member who participated in a community garden consumed a lot more fresh fruits and vegetables than adults with no one engaged in the community garden. So it didn't mean that the adult had to be in the garden, you just had to be in the household of someone who was part of the community garden and you upped your fruit and vegetable quotient. Some research is showing that community gardens actually can reduce crime in a community. They also can increase property values. New York City found, for example, that property values within a thousand feet of a community garden increased four to seven percent after establishing a garden. That's all they did. So imagine if there were community gardens throughout the state. Okay, our third category, policy, planning, and land use strategies. Um, probably aside from this group, I think for most people in Michigan, this, these kinds of things aren't the kinds of things that are on people's minds, unless you, as I say, bump into them. Like if you live somewhere and you want to have chickens and you find out you can't, or you bought a house somewhere and you find out that your next door neighbor has goats. Um, but actually, Policy, planning, and land use strategies can in fact be used to increase access to healthy food. They're sort of at the thousand foot level, but that's an important level to work on. Three strategies kept emerging as we were talking to people. Food policy councils, zoning codes, and state and local planning that includes a lens of food. Let me talk a little bit about zoning, just because I happen to be very interested in zoning. I'm a nerd enough to find it interesting. Okay. Um, local zoning ordinances are the things that define what you can do, what you can do in a residential area, a commercial, what kind of agricultural uses you can have, what, what you can do on a piece of land, what kind of structures you can put on it, how far away they have to be from the road, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I think what we're experiencing around Michigan is groups who are starting to do community gardens, farmers markets, and they're very excited, and they have their eye on the prize of the market, the fruit, the vegetables, and all of a sudden they run into policies and ordinances that are 50, 60, 70 years old, and they find out that they can't, in fact, put a food stand there. They can't put a fence along the back of the property. They can't put up a hoop house. They can't put beehives way along the back. We need to encourage all of our communities in Michigan to take a look at their zoning laws so that they are supporting the kinds of access strategies that work for their communities and that each community can decide what works for them. Okay, fourth category, it's another one of those thousand, two thousand, five thousand foot ones when you think about access, but it's on public benefits. Okay, the focus here is to maximize the current public benefit programs that we have and link them with healthy food access. So what in the world are these public benefits programs that we're talking about? One is, um, depending on how old you are, you might think of it as food stamps, but it's now called SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. A second one is, if you work in the, in the universe of health stuff, you'll call it as WIC, but it's the Women, Infant, and Children Program. And the third is the USDA food programs, the school lunch, the school breakfast, the after school program. Why does this need our attention in terms of access? Because millions 
of public dollars are spent on food through these programs every year in Michigan. And it is an opportunity to capture these dollars for fresh, healthy food. So how do we do that? Well, let me talk about food stamps. There's been a lot of work in our state around food stamps. And let me talk about two of them. I should call it the SNAP program. You can tell how I am. Okay. One um, pilot that's been going on, or one strategy, is the idea of incentivizing. Isn't that a great word? Incentivizing food stamps. What it means is to use coupons, whatever it is, to get people to use their food stamp dollars to purchase fresh, healthy food. There was a pilot in Detroit this past summer that gave coupons to people who shopped at certain farmers markets and who were using food stamps to pay for their food. And they said, if you use, if you're using food stamps for every dollar you use, we'll give you two more. Or maybe it was every two dollars you use, we'll give you two more. I'm not exactly sure the numbers. But it was a way of incentivizing people to do it. And guess what? It worked. If I did the math right, and I'm not so sure I did, but the gist of it is that customers spent an additional 41% on fresh produce. So we know it can work. The other thing around food stamps that's going on is that the Michigan Department of Human Services has been trying to help make it easier for people to enroll and apply for food stamps. So the first thing they did is they put in computer kiosks in all of the DHS offices around the state. And then the second thing they want, or now what they want to do, is they want to take those computer kiosks and put them in nonprofits around the state where a lot of people come for services. And they want to train the staff of these nonprofits and maybe volunteers to be there to help people who walk in and say, well, I don't exactly know how to do this. I'm not exactly computer literate. So they want to do that. So what, how would that help access to healthy food? An educator in Lansing talked to us about what happens or doesn't happen for kids during holiday breaks and at the summer when school is out and there's no food at home. She said, people don't want to believe it, but our kids go hungry in the summer. School means everything, including eating a meal. Well, if we had more families, we have all of the families who are eligible for food stamps, enrolled in food stamps, and able to purchase food and fresh, healthy food with those food stamps. Maybe some of their children wouldn't be quite so hungry in the summer. Okay, the fifth category we ended up with in our access piece is what we're calling our cultural transformation strategies. The focus here is, and I think Mike, you said this in your presentation too, establish Michigan as the place to be for culturally based good, healthy food that's locally grown, processed, prepared, and consumed. And I think of this as our people strategy. All these other ones need people for sure. But this is the place where we can really galvanize people who aren't foodies, or foodites, whatever we want to call us. Um, who don't really have that lens, but could be engaged in this and help us lead the charge. Three of the ideas that bubbled up were um, the idea of Innovation Angels, which is putting together kind of a group of cap uh, venture capitalists, business people, and others, and see what happens when you present them with this challenge of increasing access to healthy food. The second one was to engage cultural leaders and community experts to kind of lead the charge, a lot of different fronts around healthy food. And the third one is the one I want to talk a little bit about, and uh, what we call the Food and Farming Corps, until I talked with Ann, who talked before and being told to stop. And I, I will. Can I have one more minute, please? Okay. All right. The idea here is to take this food, this high school, good food core and ramp it up into college and recent college graduates. Would they do it? I'm betting they would. Right now, 37% of Michigan college students volunteer. It puts us 12th in the nation for college volunteerism. Us adults, we're not doing so good. We rank 18, but they're our model. Okay, so what would be the impact of all of this? I'm gonna put this very text well, let's see. There. It's a very text-heavy slide. You can take a look at it. But the impact of this 
In addition to increasing access and all that kind of stuff, let me throw a few other things out at you. If we had 20 new grocery stores in Michigan, we would create 3,202 new jobs. We didn't, I didn't talk a lot about corner stores, but corner stores, one corner store in Cleveland, they reported an increase in 20% in their fruit and vegetable sales by being involved in a corner store project. A farmer's market at Wake State University generated a revenue of sales, they think, in about $175,000. Okay. So let me close by saying this. It's tempting to think of all of these strategies as either or. But we, our conclusion is we need to think in terms of both and and. Our, our view is that access is achievable and it's important that we act now. The 59% of Michigan residents who do not have good access to healthy food, they can't wait another decade. In another decade, Michigan children who are presently in early elementary school will be graduating from high school. That newborn I saw around here earlier, she and her other cohorts will be nearing the end of middle school. For these children to grow up healthy, to thrive in school and in our communities, we need to bring the creative resources of our entire state to bear on this issue. In the future, this may be looked upon as the moment in time when Michigan stepped up to the plate and through creativity, collaboration, and commitment, achieved a level of food access and security for all of our residents that is the model of the entire country. Thank you.